lights are all street lights. The bulb inside here has a thin metal wire which heats up and glows white whenever an electric current is passed through it. But there's no heated wire in any of these. They all have different gases in them and each gas glows a different colour when an electric current is passed through. This tube has nitrogen gas in it and when electricity is passed through it, it glows that purple sort of colour. This one has mercury vapour and that's a bit bluer. And that tube has xenon, and that's a close relation of neon gas, but you can see they give totally different effects. This tube has argon, also a gas at a low pressure in it, that's purple. And this tube has helium, and that gives a sort of a very white, pale pink colour. And they're not only used in street lights. New York, probably the most colourful display of neon lights in the world. Okay, we get the colours in neon tubes from one of two gases. We use either neon, which is a red-orange colour, or argon, which is a light lavender colour. We introduce mercury into the argon to turn it a bright blue. One of these two gases is introduced into a, an evacuated tube. When we electrify them with high voltage, we get a very intense color. In this case, we have neon in this tube, this tube, and this tube. The other five colors are all done by argon mercury. The blue gas in the blue phosphorus is light. The blue gas in this phosphorus is a green. We have a dark blue because we have a blue glass with argon mercury gas in it. The deep red compared to the light red because we have a colored glass here. So, from just neon, argon, and mercury vapor, and specially colored or coated glass tubes, you can get virtually any color you like. Very large and complicated signs need a neon artist. She designs the sign and draws a plan showing how all the different types of tube fit together. the tubes are heated until the glass becomes flexible. Blowing into the tube stops it from collapsing as it gets hot. The tube is bent to fit the plan. When all the tubes have been joined together, an airtight connection is made to a powerful vacuum pump. All the air is pumped out. And a small, measured amount of neon gas is let in. Then, a few thousand volts later, I have no doubt that you have all seen this effect before. It's produced using solid carbon dioxide, or as it's often called, dry ice. Matt Irving works in the BBC's Visual Effects Department, where they use this stuff all the time. So Matt, why is it called dry ice? Well, as you said, it's solid carbon dioxide, it's not water ice. It looks like water ice, but it's got very different properties. The main one is, it doesn't actually melt. It goes straight from a solid like this back to a gas. You can see there's no liquid on this at all. Yeah. 
And if you look very, very closely, you'll see the wisps of gas, that's ignoring all the stuff coming off your chalice, you see wisps of gas coming off the solid, back to air, not a drop of liquid inside. Are there any other differences between that dry ice block and like normal water ice, such as we know? Well, it's a lot colder, it's in actual fact 78 degrees below the point, freezing point of water. It's an interesting little trick. Take a coin, which is, can be pretty cold in itself, yeah. put it on top, press. Ah. <laughs> an awful sound, why does it do that? Well, I think I'll let you work that out. It's actually quite easy if you think about it. Oh. oh, well, if it's easy, you can think about why the coin makes the noise. Matt, when you're actually employing dry ice and visual effects, what do you do then? Well, it's no real use like that. There's not enough vapour coming of it, so we put it in hot water. Now, notice I haven't actually touched it because it's very cold, and funnily enough, it'll give you a burn if you do. Never oh, touch right. it. I'm going to tip it into this beaker with a spoon, and there we are. There's your dry ice effect, just like your chalice. What is all that mist then coming off it? Well, it's a mixture of carbon dioxide and actually water vapour. But because there's a lot of carbon dioxide, it's heavier than air, so you see it's rolling all over the floor, just like you'll give a lovely ethereal effect. Yeah, well, we've all seen, like, ghost stories and pop videos using this sort of effect. I see you've got your mega dry ice machine over here. Well, this is the top of the pop special machine. It so is? This is oh, a large wow. dry ice machine. What we've got in here is really a large version of the beaker. We've got hot water, four immersion heaters, yep. two big fans that can blow it either that way, or we can fit trunking, the trunking all falling over there, to steer it in any direction. Now put your gloves on, right. because even the containers get very cold. Okay. And if we lift the container up into position, you drop it onto the handle there. Now on a cue, right, lift it down. Hey, and brilliant. The, the fan's on, close the lid. Yep. And there's your dry ice effect. I saw coming out of the tube. That's superb, is that? I'll tell you what, Matt, you've done me a big favour. It's something I always wanted to do. And that's go out in a puff of smoke. <laughs> We're surrounded by air all around us, and we've been told that air has weight, but that seems very difficult to believe. Now, David Jones has an experiment that'll try and show us that, haven't you, David? Oh, yes. I've got here a two-litre soft drink bottle, and I can pump it up with a bicycle pump. So first of all, let's put it on the balance and see how much it weighs with the ordinary amount of air inside it. That's about 180... 180.5 grams, roughly. Okay, now if you'll hold it down for me, yeah. I'll try to pump it up to three atmospheres to get into it three times as much air as it would normally hold. So this is just an ordinary bicycle pump That's pumping right. up like a bicycle yes. tire. Yes. Oh, I can feel that already, yes. There you are, you're virtually up to two. Keep going. There you are, three times as much air. Right. So that's three times as much air. How much does it weigh now? Oh, 180, no, nearly no. 186. Nearly 186 grams. We put five and a half grams of air in there, and by putting in three times as much as it would normally hold, and, OK, that's an electronic gadget. Most untrustworthy. Try it on old-fashioned scales. OK, so it's weighing more than that side yes. at the moment. Now I'll just release the valve. Watch the, the gauge there. There you are. The air's starting to go out. And here we go. There you are. It's become lighter. OK, David, I do believe you now. Air really does have weight. <laughs> Whenever we think of gases, we tend to think of the air we breathe, the atmosphere around us, invisible gases like oxygen and nitrogen. But did you know that we could make oxygen and nitrogen visible just by turning them into liquids, in the same way as you would turn, say, steam into water? Well, Peter Gates and Mike Stevens, you've brought some liquid gases with you, haven't you? Yes, we have. The first one is liquid nitrogen. And if I could pour some out to for you, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> that evaporates quite quickly, doesn't it? It certainly does. It's at about minus 200 degrees C. And so, so the table is really quite hot for it, it really isn't is. It, it yes. really is. If I lift this up, you can probably just see it. It's just like a colourless liquid. Yes. You can see it boiling away. Now, that's nitrogen, isn't it? That's about four-fifths of the air we breathe, isn't that's it? That's right. But you've also got some oxygen. Yes, we have. We've got a little bit of liquid oxygen here. I'll just lift this flask out to show you and you can see it's a, it really is quite a lovely blue colour. Oh that's beautiful isn't it? I've, I've never seen liquid oxygen before. Right. It's got 
an unusual property which I'll show you now over here is magnetic okay it's a magnetic liquid and if I pour this oxygen between the poles of this electromagnet you should see it stick there it is goodness yes and then when we turn the current off it just falls away it just falls away so how do you make this oxygen then well we've got a device over here and all we're doing is condensing the gas oxygen into the liquid by passing it through a copper coil which is dipped into liquid nitrogen and you can just see the liquid oxygen pouring oh, yeah. out there into that yes. flask. So you're cooling down the gas using something a lot colder than the liquid. That's actually. right. Right, well it's uh, not just the same as water is it? It's actually quite dangerous stuff it, this it liquid oxygen. It certainly is quite dangerous stuff. In fact it ri makes things burn quite ferociously. Right, okay. shall we have a look at that? Okay, let's just turn this off. Sorry. That's <laughs> okay, I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it well out of the way over there, shall I? Okay. We've got some items here, some cotton wool, some steel wool, biscuits and cigarettes, and we'll yeah. just see how they burn without extra oxygen and then after being saturated with oxygen. So if I put some cotton wool just down there and ask Peter to light it, you can see it burns, but not wonderfully spectacularly. That's just ordinary cotton That's wool. That's just ordinary then. cotton wool. Right, so now you're going to dip some of that into... I'm going to dip some liquid of this oxygen. into liquid oxygen. And we'll ask like this. Put it down there. <laughs> and it goes. <laughs> that was pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> it goes quite quickly. Very fast. Yes, that's because the oxygen is actually in there with the cotton wool, isn't that's it? That's right. Right. Now, um, you wouldn't think that this sort of thing would burn quite easily, would you? No, nope, still will. It's finely divided, so it'll burn slowly, but not, not wonderfully well. Yes, you it's can really see, it just smoulders away. It's glowing, really, rather than burning, isn't That's it? Right. Yes. But I expect you get a different effect when you put that into the liquid oxygen. Well, you certainly do. And I've got a piece here. Let me just... Saturated it, saturate it with the oxygen. I think I'm going to stand well back from this. Yes, do. Wow, goodness. It's like fireworks, isn't it? <laughs> it goes quite well. Right, now what have you got here then? Well, this is something people quite often burn, but. Uh, <laughs> Biscuits, yes. <laughs> <laughs> certainly nowhere near as quickly as this. It's not with quite the same thing as dunking it in tea, is it? Uh, not quite. <laughs> Right, let's try that. Goodness me, that's like firework, isn't it? Catherine wheel. <laughs> that's really good. I'm glad I wasn't standing too close to that one. <laughs> okay, lastly. Lastly, a cigarette. Well, you know that smoking can damage your health, of course. Yes, this is why I have but to let you. Yes, please. But smoking in the presence of liquid oxygen can be quite disastrous. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to soak up some uh, oxygen into this cigarette. Like that. Yeah. Let me just get rid of this Yes, minute. please. I don't want it too close. Yeah, ask Peter to light that. You can see. <laughs> wow, that's really good, isn't it? Certainly the fastest drag you'll ever see. <laughs> and if you have a look, you'll see there's no ash at all. Now, why is that? You may have heard that pollution in the air can cause acid rain. Well, David Jones has got an experiment that can show the sort of thing that happens to ordinary rain. Yes, I'm going to show you that burning ordinary matches can produce acid smoke. So if you'll please light this match. Very good. Right, we're just waiting for that match to light all the other matches. Oof. So that's there giving off the sort of gases that come from power stations and cars. That's right. Now you've got some very acid smoke there. This 
Blue liquid turns yellow if it gets acid. Now we make some rain. Blue at the top. I can see the rain going down. Oh, it's turned quite yellow at the bottom. That means the water going through that smoke has turned acid. That's right. There's always plenty of activity going on in the New York parks. And with me is David Stein. You've invented a new toy, haven't you, David, called the bubble machine. Yes. Can you show me how to make it work? Well, uh, just hold this and hold the ring in your hand there. And yeah. Keep it close. Go straight down in the bucket. OK. Like that. All the way to the, get all the fabric in. Yep, that's yeah, good enough. Yeah, yeah. Now come straight up. Mm -hmm. Straight up like that. Let it drain just a little. OK. Yes. Now uh, open the loop and go sideways. OK. And close the loop. OK, you can do it at, yeah, that's it. I'm coming back. Just open and keep open and closing the loop. Whoa, <laughs> that was a good one. Good. This is oh, such good. fun. How did you even think of the idea in the first place? Well, my uh, my little daughter Kayla was one and a half. She was totally into bubbles. We did bubbles with the uh, little store solutions for about a year. And uh, we went up to Maine and we ran out of the little bubble toys. I started making my own out of wire and we were trying coffee cans and... Uh, You've got some there. Yeah. yeah we, you can hold this tray and try not to spill. We were, I'm sure uh, I'll we were trying all kinds of ways of making bubbles. For instance, you can do it with a can like that. Yeah. <laughs> a, uh, the uh, coat hanger method. What sort of liquid are you using here? This is Joy or Dawn dish soap with 10 parts water. And what are the best places to try getting these bubbles? Well, you want to go in the shade uh, where it's high humidity, no dust, and no wind. No wind. The air, the air should be fairly clean. Then. Fairly clean, fairly still. Well, David, you're the real expert, and this morning you came out with a brand new invention that we're going to try for the first time this morning, aren't we? Uh, well, we'll try. I don't know if it's going to work. OK, let's have a go with it then. I just uh, took this up this morning. Can you remove that? We're going to use yeah. up a lot okay. of soap here. It works the same way. I mean, you just close this thing up. <laughs> Wait a minute. Not sure it's going to work. <laughs> All right. I'll stay well back. Everybody stand back. Oh! Oh! oh. <laughs> that's really good. I think that's a success. That wasn't bad. Let's do it again. Have another go. Oh, look at that. Here's a nice effect. It's called the Bubble Monster, and to make it for us is Francis. Francis, first of all, what's in here? Inside the vat, we have bubble mix. It's mainly water, a little bit of fairy liquid, and lots of glycerin. Right, well, I know you're going to pour liquid nitrous into that. Before you do, I'll get the old wacky glasses on and get out of your way a bit. <laughs> Right, now exp explain to us what's happening in the bucket there. As soon as the liquid nitrogen hits the water, it boils. You've got nitrogen gas caught inside bubbles. <laughs> uh, it seems to be steaming as well and frothing away. What's all that? Well, that steam is actually frozen ice vapor, a small piece of a cloud. 